Okay, welcome to our last session. Um, this is on um, uh, what we call the perinatal mental health clinic, Ask the Expert. And so um, what this really is, is sort of a new format. So when I explained a little bit what happened when we started thinking about this symposium and what we wanted this to be, and we thought it should be conversational and it should be talking about the issues that we're facing. So a lot of what we've really done this, this throughout the day, um, and we wanted to hear and talk from different people, um, like we said, researchers, practitioners, people from NGOs, um, advoc advocacy, implementers, clinicians, carers, and of course, people with lived experience, um, and everyone who's sort of in multiple roles at times, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and the things that um, we found is that often, as we said, we, we hear a lot of research but we don't so much hear what actually is happening and what are the issues we're facing and are people really talking to each other. So we thought, how can we design a more conversational panel type thing, but really something that could be a clinic where we're presenting some challenges or some issues that we face, some of the experts from those different areas that we've just said, and we've selected experts for that. Um, and a uh, that they could present a little bit of what's happening and um, just rather than just having, you know, a well-meaning protocol or a nicely written up evaluation of whatever has happened to actually say, okay, let's drill in what were the issues that we faced and how are we going to get around this? Any tips and tricks? So um, we have these experts and they all come from different areas um, and um, they will tell us more about their projects, good practices, that they've used um, tips and um, they each have five minutes and then we will open up the floor to the group, to the people in the room here and to the people online. And um, hopefully we will learn a lot from each other from really from this exchange um, as it has happened this morning. So I'm very pleased to introduce um, our first speaker. It's um, Linus Muvuno, Muvu. Uh, Linus is a, a keynote speaker, a global advocate for perinatal, paternal, and child mental health. His interest um, in perinatal mental health spans over 20 years. He founded the Society for Pre- and Postnatal Services, SPANS, the International Conference on Maternal Mental Health in Africa, and the Society for Pre- and Postnatal Services Vocational Training Institute. He is the African Ambassador of International Fathers Mental Health Day, and Linus has written many abstracts, several stories, published papers and articles, and he was awarded the scholarship to attend the Marseille Society conferences, population support conferences, and other conferences, um, amongst others, FIGO. Um, so we're very happy to have you um, with us, um, Linus. Uh, and I think you're there. Uh, I, wait, I, see. I can see you, Linus. Do you? Um, you yeah. can go ahead. Yeah, you can go ahead, but the problem is we, yeah, Linus, do you want to start talking? Maybe the screen will then change. Thank you so much, uh, Nico, for the introduction. Yes, I'm Linus Muvu. So let me start by saying, you know, perinatal mental health is a, it's a, it's a family issue. You know, perinatal mental health, you know, language matters. You know, uh, when addressing, you know, perinatal mental health, it's a process. Let me say, it's a thick forest, you know, and it's, you know, it's destroyed by fire to ashes. There's nothing, you know. Remember, it's a thick forest that I'm talking about. Do you think we can bring a thick forest in a single day? I think the all maybe delegates, you can agree with me, it's no. So what it means is, for sure, we need to, to take our time when addressing perinatal mental health. That's why I'm saying this is, this is a very important uh, topic. Then to state the obvious, you know, there's a rampant shortage of mental health care professionals, not only in Zimbabwe, but globally. We don't have mental health care practitioners. So our journey started as Society for Pre- and Postnatal Services. Having a standing MOA with the Ministry of Health and Child Care, we registered ourselves, you know, under the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education, Innovation, Science and Technology Development. You know, to be a vocational training institute mandated to provide professional 
training courses. That is in 2019. So in 2019, we then introduced the world first diploma in systemic family therapy and developmental counseling in maternal, paternal, and child mental health, which is accredited by a, a UK body. You know, we call it a, a CPCAP. It's a counseling and psycho, a, a psychotherapy awarding central board, which is based in UK. As I'm speaking right now, we attached 150 students in all 10 provinces to make sure that you know they are at community level to provide ongoing supportive family therapy, do referral, do the screening. You know, very interesting. I know people that they are busy talking about screening, 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 screening. Yes, screening. But most people they will still remain with the question. So what next? Now bringing the family therapies, what we are saying is we are now integrating services. We need to integrate services, not just to integrate uh, programs, but also we need services to be integrated. What we are saying is we are integrating screening and we are in, in family therapy. What it means is the family therapies now, they screen uh, the mothers during their routine antenatal and postnatal care visits. And whenever they identify any common perinatal mental health issues, family therapy is being provided. I mentioned that this is not a, a, a this is not a, a an individual issue, but it's a family issue. What it means, all family members, you know, they they, they, they come for, for 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 family therapy, you know, to make sure that you know all common mental health problems that are faced by the mother, you know, because we agree that social support is very important. So what it means is if they agree as a family, what it means is we provide healing, we provide the support that is being needed for the mother. Next steps. We are now pushing for the post now for this cadre. Both this cadre is already in the Allied, uh, Allied Health Practitioner Council of Zimbabwe under family therapist. So the register is there. So what is next? The next is the post. After the post, you know, we know that in Zimbabwe, we have got a family therapist that can be employed by the government and anyone who is interested, you know, uh, to address perinatal mental health issues, you know. So I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share about this, uh, the work that we are doing. I thank you. Back to you, Nico. Thank you, Nico. Sure. Very good, very powerful and very clear, which is great. And the message came across. And um, we're having the sort of question and answer sort of or discussion in a moment. We give the floor to the next speaker now, Yulita Kinala Malava. She's a research scientist currently working with the Malawi Epidemiology and Intervention Research Unit, Meru. Yulita worked with Malawi Ministry of Health as a nurse before joining the University of North Carolina, the Longway Project. And um, she joined Mayor in 2015. And uh, she's looking, uh, she's currently leading the Generation Malawi Birth Cohort. She, co she coordinated the Northern Region Sites of Sub Saharan Africa Region Partnership, SHARP, for mental health capacity building. The SHARP study, study integrated depression care into 10 communica non communicable disease clinics um, in three regions of Malawi. She won a grant to conduct a pilot implementation study to explore implementation challenges for integrating common perinatal mental disorder screening and management into maternal and childcare services. Yulita, um, I hope, yes, yes, you're unmuted, great. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yeah, so the convener has pretty much uh, introduced me and the slide did, uh, on the on the screen. Um, this award came through the sub project as introduced and it came with uh, capacity building for mental health. And they uh, offered, uh, they awarded grants to researchers and policy makers in Malawi and Tanzania. So I'm presenting the findings from that award. 
So common prenatal mental disorders include depression, anxiety, and somatic distress during pregnancy and uh, one year postpartum. And these conditions are very common in low and middle income countries, including Malawi. And we all know that integrating maternal mental health screening and treatment into maternal child care services is both acceptable and feasible in low and middle income countries. But Malawi has a shortage of mental health specialists, as the previous uh, speaker said, and task sharing has proven to increase the uptake of mental health services in primary health care services. Um, Malawi has implemented uh, mental health integrated services in community-based care, HIV, and non-communicable diseases clinics, but it hasn't done any CPMD's intervention into MCH settings, and this begins with screening. So the aim of the study was to assess providers' attitude towards the implementation of the integrated services, provide uh, facilitators readiness, and to assess the general barriers and facilitators for this implementation. So we conducted a mixed methods implementation research at Chirumbarua Hospital and Karonga District Hospital. We conducted face-to-face -face interviews with service users and care providers. We used evidence-based practice attitude scale and organization readiness for implementation uh, change checklist for the quantitative component. And we used interview guides for the qualitative component. Stata version 15 was used to analyze the component for quantitative research. And all the audios in the qualitative interviews were done in local language and we transcribed and translated them into English. So the key themes were identified using the CIFA or consolidated framework for implementation research. In total, uh, 56 participants completed the interviews. Uh, we found that the two hospitals were ready to implement the change and providers had a positive attitude. For the barriers, uh, we found that pre-service training for the GPs on mental health was very, very limited on mental health. They rather concentrate on possibly a two week allocation for uh, those aggressive conditions. And there weren't any guidelines on the ground for screening of CPMDs. There wasn't enough space in the antenatal clinics for these uh, integrated services. And the women actually said there's not enough space in there for us to pour out our feelings. Um, and there was also extra work workload and inadequate resources. So the policymakers at the hospital level said, who are we to say no if the Minister of Health uh, make uh, this screening a mandate or a policy? So the Minister of Health uh, was supposed to make it CPMD screening as a policy to integrate maternal mental health screening into the GP's curriculum in the training institutions and then the government to add more staff or indeed provide incentives to the already exhausted existing staff. The maternity ward was also suggested as an alternative for the screening work because it was suggested that there was a space in there. And much as there was uh, general inadequate resources, the policymakers at district hospital level said but they had the essential medications for mental health. For the facilitators, uh, having dedicated staff on the ground, supportive hospital leadership, and perceived uh, benefits of the integrated services to both providers and service users was one of the facilitators. And there was also an availability of staff, uh, mental health staff in both uh, facilities. And in this region, there's one uh, psychiatric hospital, and it's a paying one, but there's a service level agreement with the government. So it was said that if the women were identified, they were going to get the services and the government was going to settle the bills. In conclusion, the integrated services were found to be important, welcome and needed, and the providers had positive attitude. And we also found that the facilities would implement this integration but we needed to we need to address the mentioned barriers before developing the next strategies for implementation in this uh, setting. 
those are my next steps in funding available. And I would like to thank my mentors, uh, Dr. Robert Stewart, Professor Brian Pence, and Meru and UNC Project, as well as the funders. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lita. That was very nice to see. Um, we now have uh, our third speaker um, coming up, and that's in person. She was presenting. She came from the Netherlands, from Amsterdam, uh, Professor Wendy Janssens. Uh, she's a full professor in development economics at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and uh, her work focuses on evaluating drivers and behaviors and impact of interventions in the area of women empowerment, sexual reproductive health, mental health, and access to health care. Um, she has received numerous awards, um, and we're very, very happy to have her here. She's working with a team, and you can say maybe a few words yourself, um, and then, yeah, thank you. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what I will do now in the next uh, couple of minutes is share with you some key insights that we got from a program together with all the people here at the bottom, you can read it, where we contextualize the maternal mental health intervention uh, in Western Kenya. And um, we use the WHO Problem Management Plus um, curriculum for this, for the contextualization, which is based on task sharing. Um, as many of the other interventions we discussed so far, we did this in the context of a maternal and child health program run, run or implemented by from Access Foundation at that time uh, called MomCare, which was embedded within the primary and secondary healthcare system. So, um, which we felt was really important also for future scaling up. Okay, so I wanted to uh, show you here um, and discuss in a bit more detail all the steps we took for the contextualization. So we went from baseline FDDs, consultation sessions, adaptation, making new posters, et cetera, to endline FDDs. But I think in a previous session, we already had so many good insights into the challenges that people encounter, the lessons learned from all these steps that I will skip this part. Just two things to highlight. The first is that in our FDDs, we talked with mothers, CHVs, nurses, but also fathers. That's gonna come back. And um, we also used the PHQ tool here for the screening that was done by the nurses, but the nurses were not the ones then who would help the women. And we had a 40% positive screening percentage. So these were low income women, but the, the challenges were really uh, large in this setting. Now, I think I'm maybe one of the few economists in the uh, audience online and here today. So let me focus on our insights from an economics perspective. And the first important thing that we already discussed earlier today in the context of social determinants is the importance of poverty. Poverty runs through everything. Poverty determines whether women worry constantly about whether they'll be able to pay for the doctor, uh, whether they'll be able to feed their kids. Money problems are one of the main causes of intimate partner violence, right? So poverty is really a key thing. Now, if we ignore this and just focus on mental health interventions, we might be fighting symptoms rather than addressing the root cause. So I would really want to argue for trying interventions and see if you add a poverty reduction intervention to your maternal mental health intervention, mm -hmm. will that increase effectiveness? Or if you would just increase food security or improve access to savings, for example, will that reduce the prevalence in the first place so that you don't have to treat as many women, right? So I think this is a really a key, key important thing from an interdisciplinary perspective, in a sense, I think we should work together as teams to think about how we can do that. The second point, we've also discussed that in more detail already, it's partner involvement. And I think that there's three key reasons why we do want to get the man on board. The first, as was uh, shown very clearly in some presentations, is that intimate partner violence is one of the main reasons for postnatal depression. Right? So that's, in a sense, a negatively motivated reason. We want to reduce IPV, so we have to also uh, work with men. A second is a practical issue. We really saw in our pilots that, in fact, uh, if men are supportive of the uh, program, then they're also willing to bring their wife to the hospital for the session, etc. So just having them on board makes it easier for the woman to just attend. But third, there's also a positive reason. In our, our FGDs, 
Men were just saying they don't understand their pregnant women, their pregnant wives, right? She, she becomes pregnant, she becomes pregnant, preg uh, cranky. She may not want to have sex. There's all these fights that are happening and they don't know how to deal with that. So that from the side of the men, there was also this strong uh, desire to better understand what was happening and to understand what they could do to help. So that's a positively motivated reason to involve men. And I think that's something we really also uh, can think further about. Third um, is the embedding within the primary and secondary care system. That's not to say that all the community type of interventions we, ha we have been discussing are not important, but given that most pregnant women at some point will enter the healthcare system, that's really a good entry point to do your screening. Right, so that's um, and that's also not to say that then the nurses should be doing the intervention because maybe their workload is too high. So there we can start thinking about more creative ways. So one other potential area of thought would be to offer group-based antenatal care uh, sessions that include maternal mental health as well. So rather than coming from the mental health perspective, go for it, for it from the AMC perspective. And finally, that's not the most exciting topic, right? Thinking about the money, but mm -hmm. ministries of health are facing very difficult decisions on a daily basis. They have to choose between all these different priorities and there's many diseases around. So um, they want to know where they can spend their money so that they get the biggest impact uh, for the amount invested. And I think we would very much benefit from really thinking about all the impacts because we've got a lot of evidence all the impacts that mental health interventions uh, can produce, not only on mental well-being, but also for the child, for the future, and then see how much, like every dollar invested, uh, would then translate into these impacts. Um, and that, in terms of sustainability and lobbying, I think that will be uh, a smart thing to do. I will leave it at that. Yeah. Right. These are some of our posters. So I think Svetlana also showed her posters. We also have our Kenyan posters here. But, uh... Excellent. Thank you very much, Wendy. That was a fantastic presentation. And I loved how you made it very clear how interconnected these complex issues are that we've been discussing throughout the day in so many in the very different sections, but it's really all interlinked. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we're going to be talking more about this. So our next speaker, um, it's a great pleasure to attend her, is um, Professor Simone Honigman. Um, she's a medical doctor with clinical experience, and she's the founding director of the 21-year-old perinatal mental health project um, based at the Center for Public Mental Health, University of Cape Town. She has received numerous awards, um, amongst others, the Ashoka Fellowship for Entrepreneurship and the AFOX Fellowship that she's currently on. And she does a lot of implementation work and uh, she consults policy and programs and um, and she has also led the WHO guide for integration of perinatal mental health and maternal and child health services. Over to you, so much. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I'd like to use this five minutes to, to share with you um, how the PMHP, which is now 22 years old, I just realized in a couple of months, um, has over this period of time um, dabbled and worked in various different ways to address the problem. But at the same time, I'd like to, to emphasize that our learnings and our resources are open access and other people must please feel free to connect with us, use what we have on our website and I'll try and guide you to what's available so that you can take what we have, see if it's gonna work in your context, adapt it, um, because the whole, the whole philosophy is really to be able to share lessons and to be able to share um, the resources that we've managed to, to accumulate over time. Um, I'm just gonna, this is in the middle here. I just want to get rid of this. And, okay, I'll do without it. Okay, so in our context in South Africa, I think if you look at the prevalence studies across the continent, South Africa prevalence levels are right up there in certain, um, in certain areas where there's a high HIV prevalence. There've been diagnostic 
um, uh, prevalence studies showing a rate of 54% of women will have uh, postnatal depression. But on the whole, if you aggregate all the prevalence data that we have um, in South Africa, it looks like um, about one in three women will have um, depression and or anxiety. And um, until recently, there were no integrated services available. So what have we done at the PMHP? We started 22 years ago, and we, we, just, we started developing a model of integrated services. And we used the platform of the midwife obstetric unit, which in South Africa is the primary level unit where women with low obstetric risk um, will use, uh, will go for, for their antenatal care, their, for their birthing experience and their labor, as well as for some of their postnatal care up until 10 days postpartum. And we thought we'd use this platform because over 94, 95% of women, even in rural areas, will access this platform. So this was the location we chose from an opportunistic point of view. And over time, we have evolved this model to be a stepped cared model. So if you wanna ask about that, we can talk a bit about it later. We've um, refined many different elements of the model. It's much more sophisticated on the one hand, but also pragmatic and simple on the other hand. And, and currently we're working at one demonstration site in Hanover Park, which is an, an area 15, 20 minutes outside of the center of Cape Town, which is one of the highest murder rates, I think, on the continent. So it's an extremely stressed, traumatized community with high levels of unemployment, food insecurity, and, and all sorts of community violence. Um, we've, we evaluate that model on a regular basis. We have inbuilt monitoring and evaluation systems. And we have we put in dedicated counselors who are not psychologists, but they're not lay counselors. They're an intermediary level um, to provide services at that site. And we work very closely with the maternity staff at that site. We also realize the shortcomings of most of the screening tools that have been developed in the global north. Um, we have found the EPDS, among other screening tools like the PHQ-9, to be very problematic in an African setting, the multiple choice um, construct the length of the questions. It's not practical for a busy midwife to use. So we developed a local screening tool. Um, we made it a binary yes, no question. And we 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 did in, in, in addition to psychometric testing, we did cognitive testing, which is a different form of evaluation to check the intention of the of the, the meaning of of the items in the tool is understood by the women themselves. And we've had to change the language because our assumptions were debunked when we did this work. We assumed that women understood what lack of pleasure means and it, their understanding of lack of pleasure <laughs> is very different from what a health worker's understanding is. This tool is now in the maternity care booklet, the stationery that's used nationally. We've built health worker capacity We've heard a lot today about health workers being overwhelmed, not having skills. And, um, so we've done a lot of training work on addressing obstetric violence with health workers, um, addressing their own mental health needs, and also um, imparting knowledge and skills in particular, not just knowledge, on mental health. So that non-mental health specialists, the ordinary health worker, the community health worker, the nurse, the doctor, can actually have a set of skills. <clears throat> 